Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all digesting your lunch well and are ready to hear a bit about um, how we use Python in the biomolecular scientists. So, um, I personally am a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh in the chemistry department, and I work together with Lester Hedges and Christopher Woods, based uh, at the University of Bristol, who are both uh, research software engineers, and we're working on um, a Python integrated code for biomolecular sciences, which I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail in a second. So, um, I'm going to go down with the acknowledgments straight away. So, we've got funding from Asia and Oracle and EPSRC. And with that, I shall actually get started. So, what is biocomputational something? Um, so, by training, I'm a physicist. I don't really know much about this. Apparently, this is a protein, um, or at least a cartoon representation. And um, biologists or biochemists, they will go and run experiments where they crystallize this, and then they do an X-ray uh, experiment and get X, Y, and Z coordinates uh, for all the atoms of this protein, and that's why we have this representation. And these things aren't very big, so that's uh, sort of 42 angstrom diameter. Um, and what are the questions you then ask? So how does this particular smaller molecule actually bind to my protein, for example. So what I'm actually showing here is a protein called cyclophilin A, and this is a molecule called cyclosporin, and it's an inhibitor and a drug you get if you have a um, liver transplant or any kind of uh, organ transplant. So this kind of leads to what are the sort of common uses of biomolecular simulations. Um, we run them because experiments fail to tell the whole story. And ideally, we want to predict experiments, and we want to have the sort of cross-validation of what is actually going on in a molecular level. Um, so a typical question could be, how well do, I don't know, 10,000 of these small molecules inhibit this particular protein? So that I don't have to make them all in the lab. I just have to make the five good ones in the lab. MD, it's molecular dynamics, I'll get to that. We, we'll, I'll explain what MD actually means. Um, I have some biology background, but so, so you don't need to come to me. I just, I just don't know what this stands for, MD. Yeah, well, I'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. I'll actually explain this. Um, so, in fact, what we do is we run simulations, these molecular dynamic simulations, where we take our cartoon structure and see it wiggle about, essentially, and then we can ask things, how do proteins fold? Or we ask things like, how do proteins actually interact with each other? Because in our body, we have so many proteins, and all they do is interact with each other all the time. Um, but we're interested in what actually happens on the molecular level. And here's a, sort of uh, an overview of timescales in biology. This is a very sort of busy slide. Um, and A, you have various experimental techniques to probe biology, and you have various computational techniques to probe biology. Um, so in order to know something about structures, as I already said, you do something like X-ray crystallography, where you actually freeze your protein, and then, as you would in a, a GP practice or something, uh, take an X-ray of your protein and get some structural information. You might also be interested in dynamics information, which bits of the protein move in some way. Uh, this is where nuclear magnetic resonance comes in, and different types of experiments can probe different timescales. So in a protein, you have certain vibrations, so how fast do atom bonds vibrate? Uh, side chain rotation, so Proteins are made up of amino acids. These are the building blocks. And how do they move about? Um, then ligand binding happens at timescales between sort of 10 to the minus 7 to seconds. Um, how does catalysis happen? So proteins are often enzymes, so they speed up a reaction in your body. Um, and these are all things you can study with experiments, but you can also study them with these molecular dynamic simulations or in some cases, you might have to resolve to quantum mechanical descriptions of the protein, but this is not what I'm talking about uh, right now. So um, molecular dynamics can probe timescales from 10 to the minus 12 seconds to about 10 to the minus 3 seconds and pushing it sort of 
to a second, but that's very uncommon. Uh, and then you have a vast zoo of various experimental techniques that help you with a structure determination, some dynamics, and then you can compare these two. So how do we actually do these um, MD simulations, or why do we want to do them? So a typical 200 nanosecond protein dynamics trajectory generated in a computer looks like this. And in particular, we're just focused on these four amino acid side chains, which I've highlighted here, and they wiggle about. Um, you can now go and uh, look at a particular time trace of, say, this dihedral angle here of this uh, phenylalanine ring. And then you can do some statistics and data analysis, and it's all great. Um, so what are the sort of ingredients to actually run this kind of simulation, which is the molecular dynamic simulation, is essentially you take a box. Into this box, you put a protein and some water molecules. Um, and then you need to find a way of describing your protein. So it's atom coordinates. The protein has, I don't know, 4,000 atoms or something, and they interact with each other. So you have angles, you have um, uh, bonds, you have dihedral angles, and you have electrostatic and columbic interactions. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of what they look like, and you call them force fields. And different types of atoms have different parameters. It gets very complicated. But basically, you define your potential uh, your forces between your atoms by, by this force field. Um, and then you use the forces to integrate uh, your system over time by using Newtonian's equations of motion and using a leapfrog integrator or something like this. And then you run your dynamics, and then you hope that the ensemble average is equal to the time average, so you have some stationary observables, so you can uh, look at the statistics of a... Um, uh, dihedral moving or side chain movements or whatever you might be interested in, how a ligand binds to a protein and what the interaction energy is and so forth. Sorry. Yes? Is that MD stand for molecular dynamics? Molecular dynamics, yes. Really? Yes. So what is a typical workflow? It's very complicated and the whole sort of field of molecular dynamics has been developed in the academic world over the last sort of 30 years, mostly. Um, <clears throat> and usually what happens, you go through a bunch of prep steps, simulation generation or trajectory, data generation steps, and then an analysis step. Um, so download PDB. PDB stands for the protein data bank, which is where all the crystallographic data is stored. Um, then usually that file is not very well uh, behaved, so you need to do some work to it. Uh, then you need to actually generate this box with solvent and so forth. Then you actually run your integration dynamics, and then you have all these uh, XYZ coordinates of your trajectory you need to analyze in some kind of meaningful way. Um, for this purpose, an entire zoo of different software has been generated over the past, mostly uh, in academic groups. Um, <clears throat> So some of them are Python-based. Most of them are a mix of I don't know, TCL scripting, Perl scripting. Um, these are the simulation um, uh, toolboxes that actually run the molecular dynamics, i.e. the Newtonian integration steps, uh, which are mostly C++ written. Some of them have Python APIs. Some of them don't. And then you have a vast zoo of analysis scripts um, or libraries, which some of them, more the, the more modern ones are written in Python, most of them are things like TCL, Perl, and whatnot. So then you have the problem of various uh, <laughs> coordinate files and trajectory uh, files and force field files that are obviously not standardized across all the different tools. Some tools can read more of these uh, file formats than other tools, and it's not very easy to interconvert between these file formats. Uh, so oftentimes, people will just write their own parses. Um, so here's a very simple scenario. I, as a researcher, want to run simulations uh, using a particular simulation toolbox, and that's called Amber. This is their amazing logo. Um, 
And my collaborator has given me a coordinate file in Gromax coordinates, a different simulation tool. So typically what we would do is I visualize the coordinates to make sure that they are not stupid. Then um, I would have to convert it to a file format that can be understood by Amber, then run the whole setup where I generate the box and the water, and then actually run my dynamics. So I would use one particular tool called VMD in this case to visualize uh, my structure. Then I would save this either using this VMD a visualization tool uh, to a different file format, in this case the protein database format, or I could use a Python tool to do so, or I could use five other tools that also do this. Then I can uh, run the simple setup, which is taken from this Amber tutorial, where you basically go from your file, go through a bunch of essentially bash scripts to get to the point where you can actually run your dynamics and you get your XYZ trajectories out. Um, so you can do that with Amber on its own. You could use a tool that kind of substitutes the, the, um, uh, the many bash things in a one line command line argument type thing. Or you could use an online uh, web app that generates uh, a Python script for you which you could run to, to do the setup or so forth. There's even more than that. And then eventually you can run your actual simulation which would usually be from a bash terminal running a command like this. So it's all quite complicated, and particularly if you start out, you're very confused, and it's like, why do I have to know all these things? It's very complicated. So <clears throat> the problem is most of these tools have grown organically in different labs. There's not a lot of communication. Um, there's a lot of sort of hacky bash scripting where you inherit some bash scripts from a previous PhD student who's never really tested it properly. Uh, then... <clears throat> You have to be essentially an expert in many different types of software in order to be able to do all the things you want to do. And if you find a problem which your software you know can't do, you get into this Google trap where you search for something you're trying to do and then you find on ResearchGate or on Stack Overflow, here's how you do it. And then you try it and it doesn't work and then you go to the next solution and you try it and it doesn't work and eventually maybe you find something that works. But basically you lose the focus on the science you're trying to do rather than trying to use all, all the tools. Um, so this is where BioSimSpace came into play and this is the Python code I'm, I want to talk about. So basically all this complicated workflow I've just talked about can be condensed into these seven lines of Python. Um, so, yay, exactly. <laughs> it was a big build up, but hey. So, um, the idea is actually that we're not rewriting all the underlying tools, we're just wrapping around all these underlying tools uh, and making it very easy for an academic user who had some Python experience and some scripting experience to actually interact with an API that lets you focus on the science. So in this case, uh, well, we import by a sim space uh, and then we can read this Gromax file, uh, we can visualize it, uh, we can get the molecule, we can then parameterize the molecule with this force field, we can solvate it, and then we can run it. And it doesn't matter that it was a grow, Gromax file, we can still run it in Amber, it, it, it's completely agnostic to this. So uh, at this point, I will go to a live demo of how this works, hopefully. Um, so basically, everything we've prepared at the moment is um, <clears throat> we're running a Docker image of the software on either the, an Oracle cloud service or uh, Asia, and you can try it out yourself um, if you wanted to. So <clears throat> we have uh, we import the the, uh, the library, uh, and then in this case, I'm reading a coordinate file and this force field file in. Um, in order to define my molecular system. And before I had to go to my bash console in order to open this VMD, now I can just look at it in, in the browser in the Jupyter notebook. Um, 
So you see this box and there's a little molecule in there. I can also look at a particular molecule if I wanted, so I can do something like So I know the zeroth molecule in this case is actually this peptide I'm trying to simulate, which is uh, alanine dipeptide. It's not a very interesting system from a biological point of view, but for demonstrations, it's great. Um, and then we can run in this tool a typical simulation workflow, which would be minimizing this water box, uh, running an equilibration where we actually get the temperature of the system to 300 Kelvin, and then we do a production run, which we then take the trajectory to do our analysis. Um, and we can also kind of, we've implemented a sort of standard default protocol, which can be easily overwritten by any expert user. Um, uh, so basically what you define is this uh, protocol, and in this case we're running an equilibration, and then you have all these default parameters that are automatically set, or you can set them yourself if you wanted. So in this case, uh, we're running for 0 0.05 nanoseconds, so 500 femtoseconds. Uh, and we're doing a temperature raising from 0 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. Um, and we don't restrain backbones. That's a very technical term in this case. So we define the protocol. Then we define a process. We want to run an MD process. We don't run it, and we give it the system, the molecular system, and the protocol. Um, and then we can just simply execute this um, using Sander. So basically, actually, Biosim Space will lo look in your path and see what tools are available, and then choose the one that is best suited for the job you're trying to run. Um, you can give it a working directory. If you don't, it will create some temp directory and uh, write things there. Um, and it actually... <clears throat> then writes these files. So md.amda and md.rst7 are the two input files uh, I read in. And, uh, sorry, the md.rst7 and the parm7 are the two input files I gave in. But the md.amber is the configuration file that was auto-generated by the uh, protocol because someone decided that this is a best practice protocol for uh, your equilibration. If I didn't like this particular protocol, I could just give it a config file if I want it instead, and I don't have to deal with it. I can look at this config file, um, which, yes, you need to be kind of an expert in order to understand what's going on in there. If I don't care about these things because I know someone decided that this is a good protocol, it's great. I can just run the dynamics without having to understand all the different bits. Um, I then can look at the argument string for the command line to actually run my simulation. Um, <clears throat> I can then actually get these arguments, and um, that returns a dictionary, and I can unset them, change them as I wanted to. So I can set this minus O flag here to false. Um, it's now false. If I now look at the arguments again, the minus O bit from up here is gone. Um, and I can just reset to the original in case I messed it all up. And I can start running this process. Uh, so this is now running on a Oracle Cloud instance. Um, and I can query various things about it. Is it running? Uh, how long has it been running for? And then, obviously, sort of the more protein uh, simulation interesting parameters, such as what is the total energy of my system? So at the moment, it's minus 6,494 kcal per mole. And I can um, kind of monitor an update of this. OK, so the time moves up. I can also interactively plot a uh, time series of what's happening. So here I'm plotting uh, the time versus the temperature. So we said we're slowly going from zero to 300 Kelvin. So I don't know, there's a spike because that's part of the algorithm and then we're t slowly ramping up. And then we can look at how the total energy changes over time. And then the main thing what you're usually interested in is the analysis, the data analysis, um, <clears throat> which uh, 
you use the trajectory uh, XYZ coordinates to actually do the analysis. And um, so you can get your trajectory, you can, I'm gonna stop here with the demo. You can access the trajectory data in different uh, tools. So MD analysis is a Python tool for trajectory analysis as well as MD Traj. So we are wrapped around both of them and you have complete access to either of them essentially. Um, <clears throat> And then you can write out stuff, uh, yeah. Okay. So what is Biosim space? Basically it sits in this layer in the sort of simulation setup, simulation run and analysis layer, but not so much in the sort of cleaning up of the X-ray data. Um, but there's quite a lot of commercial software available that does that really well, so we didn't wanna uh, dive in there. Um, so sort of a very quick overview of the API. So um, <clears throat> we try to be as clean and obvious as possible. So basically protocols are the things you want to do, like an equilibration or production run, um, whatever you could think of. MD is the dynamics. This could be Monte Carlo, um, has a lot of um, potential to be extended. I.O. is anything that has something to do with writing and reading files. Um, gateway contains a lot of information such as units, um, how to handle the processes. Trajectory contains the trajectory data. And process is obviously the guy that manages all the, the, the processes essentially. So what is Biosim Space? It's an interoperable tool for biomolecular, biomolecular simulations. And yeah, it's kind of the same thing. So uh, it encompasses system setup, trajectory generation, and simulation analysis, and kind of supports. And the aim is to support um, underlying existing um, software. Um, so in summary, it is a Python API, API that allows you to write uh, workflow components for biomolecular simulations. Uh, the idea is, is that you can really focus on the science you're trying to achieve and not so much the um, knowing how to use the software. Um, we're very much p pushing for cloud use so that you can basically spin up an instant of a GPU cluster, send your jobs there, it runs them and they come back. Um, and we're planning support for um, workflow managers such as NIME and uh, common workflow language. I don't really know if either any of you use this. Uh, what it's not, it's not trying to be a workflow engine. We don't want to manage all the workflows. We just want to be able to write a tool that allows you to do so. Um, <clears throat> it's a top-down, it's not a top-down approach, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to um, make it easy to, for different softwares to communicate with each other. Um, and it's definitely not finished. We started this project in January this year, um, and it's got funding for two years. Uh, and yeah, we hope that people might be interested in getting involved. And this is open source. It's all open source. Oh yeah, it's it's on GitHub. Um, I think there we go. It's awesome. GitHub Michelle Lab Biosim Space. Uh, it also has a website and all the um, server. Uh, the, the, the cloud server, the um, uh, Docker image, they're all available for download and playing around with it, essentially. And all the software is online, uh, all the code is online. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm happy to receive questions. Uh, thanks very much. Are there any questions? Five minutes. Hello, I have one rather weird question. I work also in the life sciences and can witness a lot of hacky code, uh, especially biologists don't really take care for, for nice coding. <laughs> uh, one question, my question is, why does the Python example code you showed not follow the PEP8 naming conventions? <laughs> yes, excellent question. <laughs> so this has, um, legacy reasons, which aren't great, uh, but um, 
So Biosim Space builds on a code called Sire. Uh, Sire is a biomolecular software library written in C++ uh, with its entire API exposed to Python with Python wrappers, but obviously it was written in C++ style, so we decided to keep everything in the C++ style and not go with PEP because it would have ended up being some weird mixture of everything, so rather just go with one off style than, yeah. Thanks, uh, any other questions? Anyone? Very nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask to about uh, the submission of the of the task of the uh, of the simulation because a uh, lot of uh, because I also uh, I'm a PhD student in biomolecular chemistry mm -hmm. and my colleagues uh, working with uh, very weird experiments trying to change the parameters and do a lot of uh, programming changing the dynamics. Uh, and we also have clusters mm -hmm. uh, on the whole Republic, Czech Republic for academical purpose. And uh, you need to ask, uh, you need to submission to task or to, or, or, to, or to job in the queue. And then you retrieve the, re, uh, retrieve the uh, result. Yeah. And uh, I think that uh, different environment can be tricky to, to approach this. Do you have any idea how can be this solved? So I mean, submitting. So, so the idea is that you would write, I don't know, a hundred-line Python code with this API, and then you have a Python script, and you can just submit that, whether I don't know, Q sub or whatever plus um, scheduler you use to a cluster. I think this is dark or something like this. Yeah, I mean, it, do, it doesn't really matter. So it's just basically you just call a Python script. You just have to have the software installed um, on the cluster, I suppose. Um, what we're particularly interested in is sort of generating artificial uh, cloud clusters. So at the moment, well, we use a lot of GPU computations because they're fast um, for the kind of purposes I want to use it. And um, so we just spin up a um, GPU cluster in the cloud. It's alive for the time of the simulation, and then it shut down again and uh, we also have a local cluster but I barely use it anymore because it takes forever to get anything through it so yeah yeah and uh, do you know about elixir sorry do you know about elixir um, no I've not heard about uh, it's it's part of uh, European Union that this initiative for biomolecular and biological tools mm -hmm. you, you have the database of this tool mm -hmm. you can uh, you can uh, ask for help and you can propagate your software and okay. fi find the way it's supported by European Union and okay. you, you can find the way how it can be moved forward okay cool Elixir. Elixir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one? E-L-I-X-I-E-R. Yeah, yeah, I can help you with later. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, sorry, a, I attended this meeting because I was a Python programmer and my wife is a biologist. So, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, see, I, I keep seeing she doing some like simulation, which I actually don't understand. But uh, there's one time as a sport, there's some keyword just jumping in my eye, which is a Python. So if you're confused, I think it, she she's using uh, she was a uh, in LMB in Cambridge, mm -hmm. so it's a, a laboratory of molecular biology. It's a, a lot of multi, uh, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, I think that in their inst institute they use some uh, simulation tools. Uh, seems like commercial. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure. I just. So just there, there are very few commercial simulation tools because industry, at least for biomolecular simulations, because yeah. um, only in the last sort of two years, pharma industries, who are probably the main target for this, have shown interest in molecular simulations. The problem is these simulations do take quite some time, so you have to wait for a week or so to get okay. your trajectories back. I think, she, yeah, she was doing, sorry. Yeah, and so um, 
that just wouldn't fit timeframes of uh, pharmaceutical companies to do lead to target optimization, but this is changing now. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, uh, just ask a yeah. sorry. Sorry to bother the guys. Um, I think if if she wants to use like a use simulation to to simulate the the interactive of some molecular, a small molecular towards some target point. So is it, can we use this? Yes. Use so this source? this the, the soft the underlying software we support can do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're out of time now, but can we thank Antonio again for really interesting speech? <laughs>